We left off last time in Hosea chapter 5, uh, verse 11. And there it begins to outline what is going to occur to the northern kingdom of Ephraim, Israel, as a result of her political recklessness. A folly. A folly in which the religious leadership were willing accomplices. Now, as becomes explicit in verse 13 of chapter 5, it will be Assyria that God uses as the vessel to carry out His wrath against His own set-apart, but now faithless people. So, open up your Bibles and let's reread the final verses of Hosea chapter 5. We're going to start reading at verse 11 and go to the end. Just a few verses is left. Hosea chapter 5, starting at verse 11. Ephraim is oppressed, crushed by the judgment because he deliberately sought out futility. Therefore I am like a moth to Ephraim and like rottenness to the house of Judah. Judah. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, Ephraim went to Asher. He sent envoys to a warring king. But he can't heal you, can't cure your wound. For to Ephraim I will be like a lion, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I'll tear them up and go away. I'll carry them off. No one will rescue. I'll go and return to my place till they admit their guilt and search for me seeking me eagerly in their distress." You know, when reading the Bible, we of course find that the focus is entirely upon the Hebrew people. And this focus begins as early as the twelfth chapter of Genesis, when Abraham was selected by Jehovah to create a separate people group that would be different than all other people on the planet. Not superior, just, the, just not the same. And the only difference between them and everyone else would be, whom is their God? Now, we must recognize from Genesis chapter 12 an implication that only a precious few in the world as it was around 2000 BC may still have been worshiping the one and true God that created Adam and Eve and constructed an entire universe out of nothingness. Mankind had turned to human fabricated God systems, and that included Abraham and his family. What was different about Abraham? We really don't know, other than Jehovah somehow foreknew that Abraham would accept the call to turn away from idols and instead to hear, trust, and obey the supreme and holy Creator. Something like twelve centuries later, after Abraham's grandson Jacob had founded the twelve tribes of Jacob, called Israel, we read of how Ephraim had behaved the opposite of Abraham. Whereas Abraham journeyed from idolatry to faithfulness, Ephraim turned to idolatry from a former faithfulness. Yet, even though the Bible focuses on God's set-apart people, these represented only a relative few among the earth's population and, and involved but a tiny area of land on our planet where they lived. Now, there was much going on around, on, uh, surrounding Israel and Judah and beyond. A vibrant world of many races and ethnicities and exotic cultures uh, that existed in every corner of our globe. Nations were formed. Subsan substantial civilizations had died off. Empires had already been built and collapsed, only 
to be replaced by others. All this by the time of Hosea in the 700s B.C. You know, Israel and Judah didn't exist in a vacuum. Communication was primitive, it was slow, but it was effective. These nations were known to one another. And I'm going to take just a few minutes to give you kind of a broad overview of what was happening in other parts of the world, some of which had an effect on Israel. Now, I do this so as to lift us kind of out and away of a kind of mythologized brain cloud vision of the biblical happenings and characters that's just much too easy for us to fall into. And instead, I want to make it more real to us as it was. Because if we can do this, if we can do this, then we can better grab hold of the enduring God patterns that emerge from human history that have and will play out in our personal lives, in our national politics, and in our Judeo-Christian religious institutions. Right at the midpoint of Hosea's writings, his prophetical writings, in fact, right about when the fifth and sixth chapters were being written, Rome was established. And before Hosea finished with his work, the first Olympic Games would be held. Egypt, so very ancient by now, was already in the period of its 23rd and 24th dynasties. It had finally recovered from Israel having left it six centuries earlier, taking with them most of the skilled labor force that the, the pharaohs relied upon to build roads and, and, and uh, vast tracts of mud brick structures so that their native Egyptian males could be used to, to form a formidable national army. The pyramids by Hosea's time were already in a state of deterioration even as the newest one was now 1800 years old. In Europe, iron working had become widespread. Eastern Europe and Scandinavia were the outer limits of the known world. And for the most part, that region of the world was wet and it was cold. And so this limited the food supply, which is the determining factor in how many and where people could live. But due to the warm waters of the Mediterranean and the ambitions of their politicians and businessmen, Greece was thriving. They were expanding. They began to populate islands in the coastal areas of the Mediterranean, establishing colonies, cities, and also then moving westward into parts of sparsely populated Eastern and Southern Europe. The Greek seafaring society soon would dominate the sea shipping routes ranging from Northern Africa all the way to Spain. It was during Hosea's lifetime that Homer wrote his two epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Far away in North America, the first migrants had arrived long ago in the Alaskan region, crossing over the Bering Straits when sea levels were lower. They were slowly moving south, no doubt as they discovered a warmer and uh, more inviting climate down there. A spreading culture known as the Olmecs began in what is now modern-day Mexico and Central America and their influence had begun to spread north. Ancient native settlements had been discovered on both coasts of North America that date from the 8th century BC and even earlier. From the Olmecs came the Mayans and they also spawned other large civilizations to their north and to their south. 
In Hosea's era, China and the Far East had advanced cultures. They boasted enormous populations. The Zhu dynasty by now had controlled ancient China for nearly three centuries. Seafaring Indonesians, well, they stretched out their influence and by now had established colonies in Australia. Their offspring became what we today know as the Aborigines. And the Aborigines had, al had already settled not only the coast of Australia, but also well inland, all by Hosea's era. And I think this is enough to paint the picture that I intended. The world didn't center around Israel and Judah, except for spiritually. Israel and Judah were just small actors on a very big stage. In fact, in some respects, Israel and Judah were not nearly as advanced or influential in their civilization as others in Asia and Western Europe and Northern Africa. What made Israel and Judah at all interesting to other nations was that they had developed some abundant agriculture. Their western border was the Mediterranean Sea with several good ports and a couple of major north-south trade routes, one called the Via Maris and the other the, the uh, King's Highway, wound their way through their territory. So, this was the world of Hosea. He would have had knowledge of several of these nations and their cultures, and they of his. But one civilization in his region had become the superpower. And they were quite aggressive in their empire building ambitions. This was the Assyrians to Israel's northeast. This is also the world that the ten tribes of the northern kingdom would be scattered and dispersed into. So, verse 11 of Hosea chapter 5 is speaking of that time when Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, would conquer Ephraim, Israel, and, and the people would be in process of being expelled from their homeland. Now, this is another verse of Hosea that has been very difficult to decipher. First, because the condition of the oldest manuscripts of Hosea chapter 5 is poor, and because the Hebrew words chosen are themselves challenging to understand. I want to give you just a quick sample of various attempts to translate this one verse into English. In the uh, JPS version, oppressed is Ephraim, crushed in his right because he willingly walked after filth. In the Tanakh version, Ephraim is defrauded. He's robbed of redress because he has witlessly gone after futility. The King James version, Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walk, walked after the commandment. Not a lot of similarity between all of these. Some of these don't even make a lot of sense to us when we, when we read them, and this is because some of the Hebrew words that are used and the sentence structure itself are uncommon. And I think from my research, the JPS Tanakh version is probably closer to the intent. Now, H.L. Ginsburg uh, renders this verse this way. He says, Ephraim was defrauded, robbed of redress, because he, meaning Ephraim Israel, has been a fool. He has followed delusion. Now, this fits very nicely with where the same words are used in very similar sentence structure, or expressing a similar thought at least, in Leviticus 5, in Deuteronomy 28, in 1 Samuel 12, and Amos 4. So, what do these words actually mean then? That Ephraim was defrauded and, and robbed of redress. 
it means that when the time comes that they are finally exiled, they will not be treated justly. And as an expelled people living in as foreigners in Gentile nations, they will not have the same legal means and protections to have their grievances heard as would the citizens of those various nations. And why is this situation coming about for Israel? The second half of the verse says, Ephraim has been a fool by following a delusion. The delusion no doubt reflecting their trust in the Baals to provide for them, the way Gomer symbolically trusted her lovers. And this is due to the hybridized religious system Israel had adopted, which tried to mix pagan elements with their Hebrew faith and the Baals with their Hebrew God, Jehovah, and then think it all good and righteous. Verse 12. Verse 12 says, Therefore I'm like a moth to Ephraim and like rottenness to the house of Judah. Now, <clears throat> this translation is technically correct. However, in modern English, what does it mean to be like a moth to Ephraim? Being a moth is an expression. A moth feeds on what? Weakened fabric. So, for a better word picture, I think, for us in the 21st century, this would be better rendered. Therefore, I am like rot to Ephraim. Now, when speaking of Judah, a different Hebrew word is used, rechab, and it means decay. Now, because this verse is written using the common Hebrew literary practice of couplets, which use slightly different words to express the same thought in just two different ways for the sake of, well, really for drama, for making it more memorable, then the best way to render this verse is probably, therefore I am like rot to Ephraim, like decay to the house of Judah. Personally, I think there's a problem with the way this verse has come down to us, in the same way that this problem also appears in the next verse. Verse 13, which is connected in thought, to verse 12 says this, When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, Ephraim went to Asher and sent envoys to a warring king, but he can't heal you or cure your wound. Now, the events of this time frame that is being envisioned, it's about 740 B.C., there is an immediate and noticeable problem with this verse that also directly affects the preceding verse, verse 12. It speaks of Ephraim and Judah together going to Assyria for help. Somewhere along the way, an ancient copyist made a mistake, or he misunderstood and he inserted the word Judah, where originally the word Israel must have been written. So I don't think the word Judy belongs in either verse 12 or 13. By no means did Judah approach Assyria for assistance. Only Ephraim and Israel did that. Both of these verses are dealing with Israel who runs to Assyria for assistance. So in your Bibles in verses 12 and 13, I really think you just need to cross out Judah and insert Israel, which I'm quite convinced was the original way it was written. Now, the terms sickness and wound in verse 13 are connected in, in, in meaning to rot and decay in verse 12. Now, there's a couple of keys to grasping the gravity of this verse. First is, the king of Ephraim, Israel, at that time was probably Pekah, went to the king of Assyria and asked to ally with him in order to attack Judah. The complete Jewish Bible uses the term Asher instead of Assyria. And this is correct. Asher is not the same, is not the name of the nation. 
It's the name of its God. Asher and Assyria are directly related, but they're not the same things. A nation and its God were seen in that era as one organic entity. So Asher was the God, Assyria, his nation. Now, when we see this from Jehovah's viewpoint, it is, of course, the God Asher that Ephraim was going to go seek to help him against Judah. So while the complete Jewish Bible has that part of the verse correct, the next words, sent envoys to a warring king, that is not correct. Notice again the use of a couplet. Ephraim went to Asher, sent envoys to a warring king. The first half of the couplet speaks of the nation's God. The second half of the couplet speaks of the nation's king. The problem in translating is that the Hebrew term Melech Yareb is so much about a warring king as it is about a king who is being, who is behaving like a champion. That is, the king is willing to be a patron who champions the cause of someone. Eh, in reality, usually for a prophet might war be a means of championing a cause? Certainly. Just rent out your army. But that is incidental to the meaning. The better rendering is, and sends envoys to a patron king. Not a warring king, a patron king. Now let's, so let's, now let's, let's reconstruct this verse. Using modern English meaning to extract its intent. So it should, th this is the point of the verse. When Ephraim became aware of his sickness and Israel of his disease, Ephraim went to Asher. He sent envoys to a king who might champion his cause, but the king was not able to heal you, nor can he cure you of disease. See, that all works together. There is a Hebrew expression, nala makateka, that literally says, literally word for word, says, your wound is sick. Now what that expression means, however, is that whether it's a wound or whether it's a disease, it's very severe. It's of a very severe nature. This is what is intended with verse 13. Israel's problems are of the most serious kind, and no human king can solve them, no matter how great a champion that king may be to Israel's cause. And why is this? Verse 14 addresses why the king of Assyria cannot cure Israel of what ails them. Verse 14 says, For to Ephraim I will be like a lion and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I will tear them up and go away. I will carry them off and no one will rescue. Now, before we get into the particulars, the crux of this verse is this. The reason that the king of Assyria can't cure Israel's disease is because only the God of Israel can do it because the God of Israel is causing it. Here we get something that so greatly bothers Christians. God is saying that on the surface, it may appear, it may appear that he is allowing Assyria to attack Israel, in other words, by stepping aside. But in reality, he's making it clear he's directly and actively causing Ephraim's demise. That is, it is possible for those who claim to worship him to eventually become so deluded in our beliefs in our worship practices, that God will act severely against us. Believers, Yeshua didn't change this. Indeed, there are times when God steps aside. He allows bad things to happen to us, but there are also times that He directly causes bad things to happen to us. That said, when God causes something bad to happen to us, this is what we can rightly call God's wrath, 
it is always at the end of a very long road of a series of corrections that we, as an individual or as a nation, have refused to acknowledge or repent or change. And although it's only my opinion, I think this God pattern shows us that only in the rarest of occasions does God pour out His wrath on an individual. And more often, that He directly pours it out on a nation communally. But beware, Hosea's prophecy is revealing this invisible line in the sand that can be crossed, which results in wrath. Now, if I knew exactly where that line was, I'd tell you. Or maybe I'd put it in a book and sell it for a lot of money. What I can tell you, though, is that many years ago, my dear departed wife and I began this Torah class ministry partly because we sensed something sick and wounded in the modern church, of which we counted ourselves a part, and I still do. It didn't take too much study to quickly realize just how far off course much of the mainstream institutional church had strayed, mostly <laughs> by doing exactly what Ephraim Israel had done. We have intentionally incorporated pagan worship practices into our midst, all the time thinking that if we were to just repurpose those practices into worshiping Jehovah and doing it in the name of Jesus, it would somehow become acceptable to the Father. We've also instituted a belief system based mostly on a few letters written by Paul, but that throws out the context for them, which is the Torah and it's the rest of the Old Testament. Neither science nor government nor social tolerance is going to save us when God from heaven says, enough, enough. So verse 14 again deals with this issue of, uh, without doubt, of an ancient copyist replacing the term Israel with the term Judah. My guess is going to be sometime after Judah was invaded and then exiled off to Babylon. Now, the subject clearly remains what's going to happen to the northern kingdom for its idolatry and for going to the king of Assyria for an alliance. But now, what of the lion and then the young lion remark? I, I want to demythologize something for you. There are a few places in our English Bibles that we're going to see the English terms lion and young lion used together. Here's a few. Here's the thing. Hebrew has at least six words for lion. Six. In fact, Job chapter 4 uses five of them. It was David Kimchi in the 13th century who invented this structure for the various meanings of the, the six lion terms. What he did was he claimed that each word classifies a lion according to its age and to its size. Thus, the kapir is larger and older than a lion cub, a gur, the youngest and smallest of the lions. And the arye is the bigger and older than a kapir. The lavi is more developed than the arye, and the laish is the oldest and developed lion. Now, this is completely artificial. It has no biblical or historical basis, but it's been adopted and can be found in nearly every English Bible translation. When we get rid of the term Judah now, and now we reinsert the term Israel, then once again the Hebrew literary couplet appears as it's just constantly used throughout Hosea. And when we understand that because the technique was used, uh, rather was to use two different words with essentially the same meaning, 
to form a couplet, then we can better render the first half, at least, of verse 14 this way. Now I shall be a big lion to Ephraim like a great lion to the house of Israel. Big and great are not meant to be taken as meaning a certain size and then an even larger size lion. They're just two terms with essentially the same meaning, but the couplet technique, well, that demands that two different Hebrew words be used to pull it off. Now, the second half of verse 14 begins with an emphatic imperative, ani, ani. In basic Hebrew, ani means I. Jehovah is essentially doubling down on his declaration that Israel is not to look to bad fortune for what is soon going to befall them. Rather, Jehovah is actively causing it. He's taking credit. <laughs> He's taking credit for creating their misery. And in doing this, he likens himself to a lion. A lion that attacks its prey and carries it off to devour it in his leisure. And who can take this potential meal away from a hungry lion and survive? No one. What will soon befall Israel is the disaster. It's unavoidable. God is bringing it about. No mere earthly king is powerful enough to change the outcome that Jehovah ordains. Now, these are powerful words used here. Powerful. And they're meant to terrify its Israelite hearers. Well, verse six, uh, rather 15 completes chapter 5. It's this. I will go and return to my place till they admit their guilt and they search for me, seeking me eagerly in their distress. Now, this is kind of a, um, I'm going to call it a transitional verse. It sits in the middle between the judgments we've just been reading and the invitation to repent that we're going to find opens up chapter 6. Now, one could almost say that Jehovah is revealing his strategy to return his people to him since since their restoration has always been his goal. The punishments have been previously laid out, and having done that, God will now go. That is, he will no longer be present to help Israel as their national God, as every national God is expected to do. Instead, he says he will return to his place. Where is his place? Now, there's different thoughts about this. Perhaps it means the temple in Jerusalem. I think it is more likely meaning his throne in heaven, but nonetheless, the idea is separation. Okay? In so many ways, the next step is up to Israel. God is now content to just sit back and wait for them. Israel must do two things we're told. First, they must admit or acknowledge their guilt for all the offenses he's accused them of. Second, they must work to search for him, doing so eagerly even though they have found themselves in such dire straits. There is this ongoing implication that for now God is simply unavailable to Israel. Unavailable. But it is more explicit that even if Hosea immediately transmitted this prophecy and Israel immediately began to respond with contrition, that God still would not forgive or call off the coming catastrophe. Only after the punishment, only after the exile, and in the clutches of governments of the many Gentile nations where they're going to be sent, will God finally turn a listening ear to their plight. See, the idea is that avoidance of disaster, no matter how repentant Israel might be at the moment, well, this isn't an option anymore. 
the line's been crossed. No amount of remorse is going to stop the impending doom. Bothers me. Proverbs. Proverbs 1, 23-28 says this, How long, you whose lives have no purpose, will you love thoughtless living? How long will scorners find pleasure in mocking? How long will fools hate knowledge? Repent when I reprove. I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. But because you refused when I called, no one paid attention when I put out my hand. But instead you neglected my counsel and you wouldn't accept my reproof. I, in turn, will just laugh at your distress, mock you when terror comes over you. Yes, when terror overtakes you like a storm and your disaster approaches like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble assail you, well, then they will call on me, but I won't answer. They will seek me earnestly, but they will not find me. Okay, let's read Hosea chapter 6. Open up your Bibles to Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6. Come, let us return to Adonai, for he has torn and he will heal us. He is struck and he will bind our wounds. And after two days he will revive us. On the third day he'll raise us up and we will live in his presence. Let us know. Let us strive to know Adonai. Then he will come in, uh, come, that he will come is as certain as morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rains that water the earth. Ephraim, what should I do to you? Judah, what should I do to you? For your faithful love is like a morning cloud, like dew that disappears quickly. This is why I have cut them to pieces by the prophets, slaughtered them with the words from my mouth. The judgment on you shines out like light. For what I desire is mercy, not sacrifices, knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, just like men, have broken the covenant. They have been faithless in dealing with me. Gilead is a city of criminals, covered with blood, bloody footprints. Just as bands of robbers wait to ambush someone, so does a gang of priests. They commit murder on the road to Shechem. Their conduct is an outrage. In the house of Israel, I've seen a horrible thing. Whoring is found there in Ephraim. Israel is defiled. For you too, Judah, a harvest will come. I'm just going to leave it off there. Sometimes the Bible puts the next verse, I mean, Bibles will put the next words in chapter 7, sometimes in 6. Really, they belong in 7. So we'll stop there. All right. Let us turn back to Jehovah. This is a call to repent. To repent, since turning is what repentance amounts to. However sincere this repentance actually is, it's a bit hazy to determine. Essentially, this is Israel's response to all these sobering words that have preceded this verse. But this response that is spoken of in the form of a song, really, probably belongs to the time of the latter days, a generation for beyond. Hosea's perhaps might be referring uh, even to our current generation, since the exiles of Israel are returning home. Now, essentially, this is what Jehovah has been waiting to hear. But not all Bible commentators, however, see this as a song of legitimate penitence. Rather, some like William R. Harper see this declaration of verses 1 through 3 as kind of a, um, an impulsive and insincere response that's just full of pride and hubris. Now, I admit that I can see how someone could come to that conclusion, but in the larger picture, knowing that God's purpose has always been to return His people to fellowship with Himself, I think that might be a little bit harsh to see their statement of repentance as one of pride and hubris. 
using the metaphor that God has torn us clearly connects to the lion metaphor that, that Jehovah uses for himself uh, stalking and then killing his prey. Yes, God will tear, but he is also fully capable to heal that tear. God has struck Israel hard. He's not just allowed things to happen, but with repentance shown to him, he can bind the wound that has resulted from Israel's idolatry. But what's more interesting to me is verse 2. Verse 2, after two days he will revive us, on the third day he'll raise us up, and we will live in his presence. Most any believer, no matter how new or mature in faith, nearly instantly thinks of Christ dying and then being raised to life on the third day. Now, fascinatingly though, nearly every scholarly level commentary that I consulted on this verse denied any connection to Jesus. Instead, they insisted that this was merely a Hebrew saying. It is a, a way of expressing an indeterminate amount of time, and it shouldn't be taken literally. Yet, the Jewish scholar Mayer Gruber, who, by the way, is not a believer, he wrote this. A closer reading of Hosea 6.2 should reveal that the two parallel numerical terms are not in two days' time, in three days' time, but rather after two days and on the third day. It follows, therefore, that in Hosea 6.2 we find one of the instances of synonymous parallel, parallelism in the most literal sense, which means that after two days and on the third day are literally synonymous adverbial phrases fully adumbrating the literal usage reflected in the two New Testament citations quoted by Stuart. Boy, that's a mouthful. Okay, here's what this Hebrew scholar said. He said, the two days and on the third day is meant to be taken literally, not symbolically, and certainly not indefinitely. And it is undeniable, he says, that these words vaguely foreshadow Yeshua of Nazareth dying on the cross and being resurrected on the third day. I mean, I think one has to work awfully hard not to make this connection, which is why I really appreciate the works of scholars like Mayor Gruber. He's an intellectually honest Jewish man. So while he cannot bring himself to accept that Yeshua is his Savior, he can accept that this prophecy of Hosea probably carries a direct reference to the New Testament Yeshua, and interestingly, it also is expansive enough to also incorporate the idea of all the ten tribes coming to repentance and then being revived, resurrected, so to speak. All right, let's, let's pause a minute. I want us all to read together. Get out of Hosea just for a moment. I want you to all turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. I want to give you a second to get there. Please go there. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. I'll give you a second. <clears throat> Okay, Ezekiel chapter 37, we're going to do verses 1 through 12. With the hand of Adonai upon me, Adonai carried me out by his spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he had me pass by all around them. There were so many bones lying in the valley, and they were so dry. He asked me, human being, can these bones live? And I answered, Adonai Elohim, only you know that. And then he said to me, well, prophesy over these bones. Say to them, dry bones. Hear what Adonai has to say. And to these bones, Adonai Elohim says, I will make breath enter you, and you will be alive. I will attach ligaments to you, make flesh grow on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you. You will live, and you will know that I am Adonai. So, I prophesied as ordered, 
And while I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. It was the bones coming together, each bone in its proper place. And as I watched, ligaments grew on them, flesh appeared, skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And next he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, human being, say to the breath. That Adonai Elohim says, come from the four winds, breathe. Breathe on these slain so that they can live. So I prophesied as ordered, and the breath came into them, and they were alive. And they stood up on their feet, a huge army. Then he said to me, human being, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And they are saying, our bones have dried up, our hope is gone, we're completely cut off. Thereby, thereby, uh, therefore prophesy and say to them that Adonai Elohim says, My people, I will open your graves, make you get up out of your graves, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Ezekiel prophesied a little over a hundred years after Hosea. And his main assignment from God was to deal with Judah and their Babylonian exile. And yet, this Ezekiel passage is speaking about both houses of, of Israel, Judah and Ephraim. So the idea of death and resurrection is clearly present in Hosea 6.2, just as it is in Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, how so many Christian Bible scholars can deny this connection to Israel and at the same time even to Jesus is just baffling to me. Anyway, the final words of verse 2 that are, We will live in His presence have been variously interpreted, uh, interpreted rather, but it seems quite plain to me. Okay, From the vantage point of the 8th century B.C., keep that in mind, from that vantage point, when the belief was that Jehovah was Israel's national God, and that to be exiled from the land then meant they were no longer in his jurisdiction. And so along with the comment in 5.15 that I will go and return to my place, then clearly separation is the intent. But then to live in his presence meant that Jehovah had returned to being the national god over the land of Israel. And with Ephraim's return to their land, now they're back within the territorial jurisdiction of Jehovah. Now this isn't, of course, what God necessarily meant, but the tailoring of the words could mean nothing else to 8th century B.C. Israelites. Now, verse 3 actually adds to what it means to be in God's presence, and it involves something you might find a bit surprising. The first words of verse 3 are, Let us know. Let us strive to know Adonai. Now, I want to teach you something. <laughs> I'm serious about this. I really want you to write it in the margins of your Bible. I want you to dog ear that page. I want you to refer to it often. Biblically, to know God or to have knowledge of God does not mean like what it sounds to our 21st century ears. To us, to know something is to be aware of something by means of our observation or by inquiry. It means you have some information about something or you're able to identify something. If I ask you if you know Jerry, I'm asking if this person is, this person is recognizable to you, to some degree. Now, to help get my point across, I want to read to you something with which most Christians are familiar, actually. It's from Jeremiah chapter 31. I'm going to read this from Jeremiah 31, going from verses 26 through 33. Here the days are coming, since Adonai, uh, says Adonai, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. 
And at that time, just as I used to watch over them with the intent to uproot and break down and overthrow and destroy and do harm, so then I will watch over them to build and to plant, says Adonai. And when those days come, they will no longer say, well, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Rather, each will die for his own sin. Everyone who eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. Here, the days are coming, says Adonai, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt because they, for their part, violated my covenant, even though I, for my part, was a husband to them, since, says Adonai. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Adonai, I will put my Torah within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will any of them teach his fellow community member or his brother, no Adonai, for all will know me. From the least of them, to the greatest, because I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Okay, see, we have always taken that mention about a member of the community saying to another person, no Adonai, no God, meaning acquiring an awareness of God, or perhaps gaining some information about Him. That's not what it means. In the biblical era, era rather, to know your master or to know your king, that meant to be obedient and loyal to him. The way we are all to know God is to be obedient and loyal to him. Otherwise, you know what? Most of us could say we know Allah, God of Islam. Because we're aware of them. Other, you know, I mean, let me put another finer point on it. To know God or to have knowledge of God, biblically speaking, is actually a way of saying, let us obey Jehovah by observing his moral law code. That's what it meant. That's what it still means. God's moral law code code expresses God's character and nature. Jehovah's moral law code biblically goes by the names, the Torah, the law, the covenant of Moses, a couple more really. Israel's ability to have a relationship with God, and so the ability for a Christian relationship with God is predicated on one thing alone, covenant covenant. That's it. Hosea 6.3 offers a program about how knowing God can come about. Jeremiah makes the process even more clear. He says, God will put the desire within our hearts to strive for a deeper devotion to the law covenant, the Torah, as our standard of morality and obedience. This and nothing else, nothing else, is what the Bible means by the call to know God. That's why I wanted you to write it down. Now somehow within Christianity, man, we must recover exactly the same as what if Ephraim Israel lost. It is an understanding that the law and the law giver are organically and forever connected. If we want an intimate relationship with Jehovah, then we must know the terms of his covenant of Moses. And we must use those terms as the structure for our morality and our obedience to God. Loving God is not warm feelings towards him. 
Loving God is not having tears running down our faces as, at the words and melody of a particularly impactful and inspiring worship song. That's not loving God. Loving God is being obedient to God on what grounds? As expressed by His covenant. You know, it's so very uplifting when we read those final words of verse 3 that Israel knows deep down that God's reappearance, that is Israel living again in His presence, in the only place it can happen, the Holy Land, it's as certain as daybreak. Nothing can stop the earth from turning, the sun from rising, and that is how certain it is that God will take Israel back. God coming again to Israel, Israel coming again to God, is likened to rain, to the latter rain. See, in Hebrew, there's three stages of rain. And the most spoken of, in the Bible anyway, are the first and third stages that typically are translated as the former rain and the latter, and the latter rain, or in Hebrew, Yore and Malkos. Now, these rains must come at the appropriate seasonal moments. Our crop yields will be small. And just to further make the connection, that to know God means to follow His Torah, the promise of rains at the proper times is made in anticipation of repentance and a renewed devotion to His Torah. This refers directly to a covenant commandment. We find it in Deuteronomy 11. Verses 13 through 15 says this, So if you listen carefully to my mitzvot, to my commands, which I'm giving you today, to love Adonai your God and to serve Him with all of your heart and all of your being, then I will give you land, give your land its rain at the right seasons, including the early fall rains and the late spring rains, so that you can gather in your wheat your new wine and olive oil, and I will give your, gra- your fields grass for your livestock, with the result that you will eat and be satisfied. We'll pick up with verse 4 next time. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning. Products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com. Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.